You live to know, brother. How are you all today? It's been very stressful here at the ministry. I, I have no word in my heart. I um, We'll see what the Lord has for us. I've been asking him, at least since yesterday, for a message. And nothing. He has spoken to me about other things, so I know that he's around. But he hasn't said anything about a message. And the only thing that's on my heart is that for the last couple of days when I, when I want to listen to the scripture, I just turn it on in YouTube and, and I don't choose the book, whatever is there comes up. So Isaiah has been playing for the last couple of days. I think I'm going to need a fan here, Susan. Thanks. And um, so I thought maybe we, we take a look at a, a chapter in Isaiah. But there's nothing on my heart. So I, what happens is that I just have to start. Does anybody have a dream or a question? Sometimes it comes from someone in the congregation. If someone has a dream or a question, we can start with that. Uh, if not, I'm going to start reading in uh, Isaiah. starts me talking. I haven't, um, excuse me, I haven't even listened to the news. <laughs> I don't listen to the news anymore. It's too crazy and it's too insane what's going on. I did listen to a message by Pastor MacArthur last night and, um, I have to say that he really blessed me because at least what's going on in the world today we're, we're of like mind uh, and he was saying how the church is completely how the fivefold ministry is completely has been completely seduced overtaken and they've become Baal worshippers and they're worshiping at the altar worshiping at the altar of Baal with this message of social justice it's, it's not in the scripture at all. And I know that, um, that, that we pastors, or we preachers, and those of us that have a public forum, or even a private forum, that it was appropriate to comment on what was going on. But the bottom line is that God has to be exalted. And the only way you exalt God is by preaching the word. When you become completely immersed in, in, a, in a social issue, that social issue then becomes your God and your in idolatry. And that is, seems to be what's happening across this country anyway. So I read that Europe has closed its doors to American travelers. I think I'm pretty sure, I, I don't think it was lifted, but President Trump prevented us, I, the last I heard prevented us from going to Europe. And now Europe has closed their doors for at least two weeks because of some supposed upsurge in COVID-19. The, the whole thing is just insane. I don't know anybody. I have not met anybody that had COVID-19. Well, I think Brooke may have had it. She wasn't tested and I didn't even catch it from her. I never, no one in her office caught it from her, so maybe it was something else. <laughs> um, I don't know anyone that has, that has had it. Uh, the hospitals are not overflowing here. I don't hear an ambulance riding by. Uh, I read reports on the internet of the same thing from in other states. But they go into the hospitals, there's plenty of room in the waiting room, and yet the, the press is now saying we're in the midst of the second wave of high uprise, they're saying in Texas or whatever. And they're determined to keep us terrified by trying to mandate the wearing of masks. There was a lot of traffic on the road this morning when I came in which is a good sign, people are out. I don't wear a mask outside. I, 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 every once in a while I'll see someone wearing a mask, but this is really funny. When I walk, I've been down in downtown Port, nobody was wearing a mask. And there's no social distancing going on there. The people that I see wearing the masks are all by themselves. They're out walking along the road with nobody else around them. 
those are the people that are we're wearing the masks. <laughs> so, brethren, this mask issue, it's a control issue. They want control over us. They want control over us, and they want us to be so terrified that we'll do anything that they say. So the mask is just a trial. They want to see how much control they really have over the people. And like I said, I just really know what's going on here because we can't, I can't really understand or believe what's going on, what, what I see on the internet or on the news. I don't believe any of it. So I just know what I see with my own eyes, okay? The only people I see wearing masks are people that shouldn't be, that don't need to be wearing masks because they're totally alone. I see people wearing a mask in their car and they're all, there's no one else in their car. The windows are all closed up tight and they're wearing a mask, which makes no sense at all. So this is what it's all about. They want control over us and they want us so terrified that we do anything that we're told. So the mask is harmless, but once they get it's harmless in that it's not good for you, but it's it's no no big deal if you want to wear a mask. But once they feel satisfied that they have sufficient control over us, who knows what they'll be telling us to do? That's the bottom line. Rise up again. They're trying to tell you to attack your neighbor. It's failed. It's failed. There are a lot of black people around here. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's 50-50 where I live, but there are a lot of black people. I see black people every day. No one has threatened me. No one has looked threatening. No one has even looked at me twice. We're just people walking down the street like we've always been. I don't see any sign of it here in this area of Long Island at all. We did have protesters here, but most of them were white. And in my opinion, they were silly college kids. I looked at them, they were very young. And all I could think about was, do, do your parents know what you're getting yourself involved in? You know? And they just walked up and down the street. Nobody even hung there. Well, when I was there, nobody hung there. Well, a few people hung there. So, so the world is in crisis. The country is in crisis. And Satan is trying to throw this ministry into crisis because there has to be a connection between what's happening in the world and what's happening here. It has to be reflected. I've known for years, I've never really talked to you about it, but I've known for years that in many areas my life reflects the scripture. A lot of things that have happened to characters in the Bible have happened to me in my personal life. And that shouldn't surprise anybody. The, the closer you are to God, the closer of a walk that you have, the scriptural archetypes should be playing out in your life. So uh, it doesn't surprise me, even the situation with my daughter. I, I just, um, I mean, I'll tell you the thought that was in my mind this morning. I was just, I was just about to say, well, I accept it, what am I to do? I know over the last few years, I've read in the scripture, I think it was, I don't remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember what, what character there was, but I read in two different places where the Lord said something not so good. He said something like, you're going to die, or, or, um, or your kingdom's going to be taken from you, or something like that. And in both in instances, the Bible character said, okay. And I, I remember when I read it in the book, isn't that a strange reaction? The Lord says, tells you that such a heavy judgment is about to fall on you. And your action is something like, the words were something like, it is good, it is good. What kind of a response is that? That is the response from somebody that knows that God has full control over your life. That's the response of somebody that says that they know that God has full control over your life. So you pray in a whole different way when you know that God has full control over your life. See, I've been trying to tell you this for years. I don't emphasize it because I really don't want to discourage you from praying. But I guess I'm talking, I thought I was reading Isaiah, I guess I'm talking about this today. When you, if you really, really, really believe that God has full control over not only your life, but everything that happens in the world, then what kind of a spirit is there on you that thinks that you have the power to start a prayer chain and have 50 or 100 or 1,000 people praying and 
and the person gets healed, and you think it was, well, you say it was God, but you really think it was the prayer chain that did it. So I haven't talked much about that because I don't want to discourage you from praying. So the bottom line is where you are in your relationship with God. Are you, are you close enough with God to do what Moses did? Because Moses didn't pray like that. Moses didn't start a prayer chain. What did Moses do? Moses interceded. It's different. It's different than taking, and this is what I was taught in Pentecost, take your authority. Break the curses, move that mountain, and take your authority. Jesus said, if you, if you speak to that mountain, it'll move. Well, what was Jesus talking about when he said that? To find out what he was talking about when he said that. So what, am I, what, are, what is Sheila talking about this morning? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm sorry to be uh, mysterious, but I don't have, I have not been released to tell you what, what's happening, okay? But someone in the ministry almost died yesterday. Twice. And I guess the Lord wants me to share with you what happened. Don't worry about who it was that he had. Don't worry about it. It wasn't you. If you listen to me, it wasn't you. Okay? So, I remember saying to the Lord, what am I supposed to do, Lord? You know, I did all what, I'm, what, what the church says I'm supposed to do because I couldn't take any chances. I broke the curses. I rebuked it. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what, what am I supposed to do? I have situations in my personal life that I have broken curses, I've rebuked, i begged you, i begged you on my knees to change things. Two things up front, before, before I was ever estranged with my daughter, when I saw what was going on with her, I begged the Lord on my knees for years. She continued on the same trajectory, and now we're estranged. Okay. I uh, I begged the, knee, the the Lord on my knees uh, before I went into the hospital for three months. I, and when I say I begged, I mean I rebuked, I broke curses, I did everything, and then I begged. Okay. But I went into the hospital for three months, and I needed the surgery. Okay. So, what is this prayer all about, really? What is it all about? It's all about finding out what His will is. If you want success in prayer, you have to find out what His will is. So if you're praying one thing and it's not His will, what have you got? And again, I really don't want to discourage you all from praying. I, I've been different. I've been different from, from the first day that the Lord called me. My, my walk has been different. Okay. I remember when I was a disciple in Gospel Revivals. And they were fasting. I actually tried to fast, and the Lord actually rebuked me. Am, am I telling you not to fast? I'm not telling you not to fast. I'm telling you that I have, a, I, have a, I have a specific walk. And the walk that I have represents a deep relationship with God. So you and whoever is listening to this message, whoever the Lord brings in to hear this message, you need to hear this. If you're in a place where you fast and pray and it works for you, then you need to know that there's a deeper place in God that the Lord wants you to know about. Because he rebuked me from fasting and, and what the whole church was doing, that, that the pastor was leading them into these one day fast, one week fast, you know. Uh, he rebuked me for that and he rebuked me from, from sitting there 
and trying to pray for an hour. I was instructed, do you pray for at least an hour a day? Or do you pray for at least an hour a week? Do you have a list of all the things that you pray about? And pray for, uh, uh, for us. And, and he said, do you have a set time that you sit down or you get down on your knees and you pray? That's what I was taught in the church, but I could never do it. I can never do it. So at the very least, what I'm telling you now is that there's another place. There's another place in God. The Lord may honor that for you, depending on where you are. So if you're in this ministry and you're listening to me, and you still do that, I'm not telling you not to do it, but I'm telling you that there's another place. That if, you, if it doesn't work for you and you get what I'm saying, you can pray about it and ask God for it. But the Lord reminded me today that he moved us into the most holy place a few months ago. He moved the ministry into the most holy place. That means that I'm in the most holy place. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are, but it means that you have a, that it's a possibility for you to move into the most holy place because the ministry is in the most holy place. And at the very least, at the very least you enter into the most holy place when you're listening to, to me preach. And then you go back to your own life and everyone is where they are. Everyone is where you are on a program to move forward. And uh, this I've been telling you for years that everyone, the whole church world, you're limited uh, to how far you can grow in a ministry because you can't get past the pastor. So. In this ministry, the pastor is not static. I'm not static. I'm still growing. I have no problem telling you that I'm a student teacher. And uh, I'm a student teacher, and I'm on a path just like you are. I'm just a little ahead of you. I'm a little ahead of you experiencing the experience that God has promised us. See, God has promised that experience. We need to understand that he promised it to, to Adam. And so we, we have an opportunity to experience it if we just don't die before it happens. See? But there's not a chance of experiencing it if you don't know that it's a possibility. And especially at this time, at this time in, in the progress of the church, because we're really waiting for that door to longevity to open, and I believe it's going to open in the lifetime of many of us, if not all of us in this ministry. Just hold on, hold on to your life. How do you hold on to your life? Check out, have the Lord check out if there's any sin that you need to deal with. So anyway, I said to the Lord, what am I supposed to do? I begged you to save my daughter. She's now all in the world, having worldly experiences that I would have preferred that she didn't have. And so I, I went back to knowing what I really know. You know, I've not mentioned this to you before. This is how I genuinely pray. Lord, what are you willing to do? It's just a question. What, how should I pray? You know, I don't want to pray against you. I don't want to pray against your will. So I need to know what you're willing to do for this person. And I want to tell you that over the years, on a couple of occasions, the Lord has said to me, what would you like me to do? Now maybe that sounds crazy to you, but I'm telling you that the Lord is trying to develop his character in us. He wants to develop his character in us. And when he says to you, if you ever hear those words from him, what would you like me to do? It doesn't mean he's going to do what you would like him to do, but he wants to know what you would like him to do because that's a test that he's testing your character. So, so that's happened over the years. So I'm always, I'm always careful to ask for mercy, the only exception being these seriously criminal people that are putting children in cages 
and torture and, and, and white slave, the people that, that enslave other people, hold them captive, uh, sell them on the marketplace, sell human bodies on the marketplace. Uh, people that are treasonous, that have betrayed any country, but right now we consider with our country that has, have not cared at all about millions of Americans that have lost their jobs, suffered in other, other ways so that they could become billionaires. Those are the exceptions. I think that they're all if found guilty that they're subject to the death penalty. That's what I think. And there was a time that I never thought that I would hear myself saying that, but I would go to a public execution for people that have committed crime. It's called crimes against humanity. I, I would go to a public execution. Yeah. Um, aside from that, I'm always very careful to ask for mercy and always understand that there's another side to the story. If you commit the crime, you have to pay a consequence for it. But God is into gray areas. If God, if God were not into gray areas, we would all be dead. If, if, the Lord, if the Lord exercised the law against us, we would all be dead. We, we sin every day. See, the only reason, that's just the truth. You can, we sin every day, the planet wouldn't even exist. So almost just about everything that the Lord does is a great area, except perhaps with crimes against humanity, or national crimes, or crimes against humanity. So I'm always very careful to ask for mercy. If the Lord's willing to do it, he doesn't do what, what you ask him to do. But he's hoping that you will come up with a conclusion that his character would produce. That's what he's looking for in you that your, your answer would not be um, for looking for retaliation or vengeance or anything like that. So anyway, I say, Lord, will that person live? And the Lord told me, yes, they're going to live. So I said, good. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. And uh, a few minutes later, I get a phone call telling me that uh, they're not breathing. So, it's been a very hard day, really. I could have called Tony, but I didn't want to. I was really hoping to have a powerful message today because I need it. You know, but this is where I am. So anyway, I started to pray. My whole soul has been immersed in this book on Hebrews chapter 7. And one of the things that the Lord has, has brought to my, my attention has always been in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, is that well, I've always known that God couldn't lie. I've, I've heard, you know, God can't lie. But it came out, you know, where then you could understand something with the intellectually. And, and sometimes you just have to hear it in a certain way that it goes into your, into your soul. When I preach, I, I repeat myself a lot. Because it, it doesn't get into your soul right away. You may think you understand it but you don't understand. No, no one could get it that deep the first time around. They can't. It's not possible. And the Lord wants to get us into the most holy place because that's where the miracles take place. What takes place in the most holy, what, what, in the most holy place? 
that's where, well, Jehovah's coming to us today in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he enters into the most holy place and meets you there. It's, it's intimacy with God. It's, um, it's like into you know, marital intimacy. Your best chance of having a positive response from God is meeting him in the most holy place. The place where he loves you. Now we know that when the scripture talks about love, it talks about attachment. Love. Everybody here, you should know this by now. That 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 Jehovah wants to marry us. He wants us to be his fully functioning bride, which means no separation. But it can't be accomplished right now because we have too much sin. So he has a plan, and he's working on this process to get us cleaned up, but we are our own worst enemy because we don't understand and our carnal mind gets everything backwards and um, and we have an enemy. <laughs> we have an enemy that's blocking God's truth from us and that's our fallen nature, which is who? Which is, um, which is the very breath of Jehovah. Okay? that he breathed into the creation who married the snake instead of Elohim and became God's enemy and, and our enemy. And, and if you've been studying with me for a while, I hope that you believe me when I tell you that we are the vessel, that we're not Adam, we're the earth, we're the earthen vessel. And if we don't have that treasure in this earthen vessel, we're, we're nothing but an empty vessel. Okay. I think Paul said something. So our best bet is getting into that place of intimacy with God. And the way you get into that place of intimacy with God, it's, it's through the Word, yes, but it's through submission. It's through submission. And you have to understand submission. Submission doesn't make you a mindless person. Submission to God and, and brethren, there's no way you're going to submit to God if you cannot submit to the elders that he puts over you, see? Including it from your natural family into your spiritual family. So submission is coming, submission is coming into an in agreement of mind. So once you have God's mind, then you pray with power. But you don't, you, you can pray with, with, with our power, um, or maybe you have some power in the Holy Ghost, and maybe your prayers are answered because God's meeting you there while you're still a child. So if that just hurt your pride, then you need to start rebuking your pride, but Pentecost is childhood. See? And the proof that Pentecost is childhood is that it's not holding up very well right now, is it? Is it? It's not holding up very well right now. Not many miracles in Pentecost. Lots of sick people and hurting people and desperate people that are holdovers from the Pentecostal revival. And a lot of people that never saw the Pentecostal revival that are actually buying a false Holy Spirit these days. So that was just a test. Once you're in the holy place, that's where your power is because that's the power that God gives you personally. That's your husband's power. It's not, it's not a taste of it. That's the power that goes with the character of God. So when I went into the hospital for three months, I didn't understand God's language. I still can't claim that I understand his language, but I understand some of it when he talks to me. And I'm doing my best to understand his language is very symbolic. Sometimes I hear a voice, but his, his language is symbolic. You have to interpret the symbols. It, it, it never ends. It's a lot of work. Being in the most holy place is a lot of work. You have to constantly be recognizing the symbols 
and this, and then interpreting the symptoms. So before I went into the hospital for three months, I knew I, I knew I was dying. I actually said to the Lord at that point, you've saved me so many times, are you really going to let me die? Because I was pretty close to death at that point. That was in 1990. And he gave me a vision. At the time, I had a dream that I wanted. I had just come out of my secular job, and I was working at home. I don't even remember it exactly, but the, the idea was that I wanted when you when you work in an office building, especially in Manhattan, it's maybe different here on Long Island. Only the top, 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 top people get window offices. It's a pride thing, yeah. and all the other workers are in the center of the floor, and uh, and the top executives have window office, offices with windows in them, yeah, all around the periphery of the floor. That's if the firm is big enough to hire a, to rent a whole floor. Yeah. So I wanted to have work in front of a window, and I wanted, I wanted to see flowers and trees. So just before he sent me to the hospital, he showed me a vision of me working in front of a window in my home that has, had a nice view of the flowers and the trees. And I didn't understand that what that meant was that I would come out of the hospital, because I saw myself working in front of that window, and I didn't understand what the Lord was telling me. This means you will survive. You're coming out and you're going to be working at a, at a desk in front of that window with that view. I didn't understand what he meant. So, so we really have to learn his language. And you can't even write that in a book. I, I can give you my testimonies, but it has to happen to you. you have to, first, you have to be able to see the symbols. You have to recognize the symbols, and they come, they're very subtle. They come as thoughts in your mind, or as, as um, memories uh, in your mind. And you need to consider everything. Paul says, lay hold of every imagination. So when I used that, was a, that teaching was a part of my own daughter deliverance education. And I thought that um, it meant, well, catch every thought because the, of the enemy thoughts. Well, that's true. You want to cast out every enemy thought. But you also, you, you want to see everything. You want to see God's thoughts, too. You know? And he speaks to me in memories um, a lot. You know? So it's, it's a full-time job. Um, it's a full-time job having intimacy with God. And anyway, I said to him, and he said to me, yes, she's going to live. So the next thing I know, I get a phone call that she's not breathing. And I prayed what he taught me to pray in Hebrews chapter 7, that because God cannot lie, every word he says to us, now, you have to be able to recognize the word. You have to, and he doesn't, I mean, people don't prophesy to me anymore. My prophecy is internal. The prophet that prophesies to me is Christ. Christ prophesies to me. See? You have to be able to hear from God. So, Hebrews chapter 7 says, every word that God says is an oath. He, he, he's swearing it to you because it's impossible for him to lie. So that means he took an oath. That's how he expresses it. He had to go to that extreme in Hebrews chapter 7 to get through to me and maybe a lot of other Israelites that are seeking intimacy with him because I know that the scripture said God can't lie but it's much more powerful to understand it in terms of God swore to you he took an oath he, he promised you and it's impossible for him to break his word to me, that's much stronger than reading a scripture that says God cannot lie, so it must come to pass. So I, I prayed Hebrews chapter 7. Now, anybody else could have prayed their prayer, but I had the word, unless God said it to you that she's not going to die. 
your prayer would not have the same power as the power as the prayer of the person that God spoke to. Because now it becomes an issue of God's character. I can tell you God said they're not going to die, and you can pray, Lord, you said they're not going to die, but he didn't say it to you, you see. He didn't say it to you. Now, he might honor that, but he might not, but he didn't swear to you that she wouldn't die. So, so I, that was how I prayed. That was where all my strength went. My strength didn't go into her lungs that she should stop breathing. My strength didn't go into praying for wisdom for the doctors. You know. My strength didn't go into anything other than that. The Lord couldn't lie to me. doctor walks over to the person I was on the phone with and says, I don't think she's coming back this time. She may not come back this time. I'm not sure one of those two things he said. And I said, Lord, you swore to me. And I don't think it was even 60 seconds later the doctor said, she may not come back this time. And I'm just repeating myself, Lord, you swore to me. And then I hear the person on the phone say, she came back right after the doctor said, I don't think she's going to come back this time. She came back. So she almost died twice. So it's been sort of an upsetting 24 hours. She's going to be okay. So this morning, all I could think about, and then more things happened, there were more, I don't know, I mean, I guess you need to hear this for the day that it happens to you, you see. So the Lord speaks to you in symbols. I had a memory. Now I'm thinking that she's going to need surgery. And I had a memory, which I won't share because it's really, I know you are wondering who it is. I'm sorry, I really didn't mean to do this, but I, apparently the Lord wanted me to do it, so they'll have to tell you themselves. I'm sure they'll tell you themselves. In a couple of days, when she comes home from the hospital, everything's okay. That I had a memory that indicated, a memory of, of an authority saying, that the doctor may not operate. And then this morning I got the news that there's no surgery. So it was a, a, just a memory in my mind. You need to know that God uses memories. You can't discard anything. 
every thought that comes to your mind. God, God's talking to you. He's talking to you continuously. He wants a relationship with you. Aside from the fact that he loves us, and, and he loves us in a way that it's really, it's not a human type love. So I heard, I heard in the, in the church, oh, God loves me. Well, what does that mean? Well, he gives me what I want. He gives me my candy. He gives me more money. He gives me my vacation. He gives me a job. He gives me a husband or a wife. He gives me a child if I can't conceive. Well, then that's, it, it's true he does that because you're children. But the, the adult love, God wants to give us an adult love. And, that in the, and it's different than an adult marriage in this world, even. It's actually, it's probably the dream marriage of every woman in this world that her husband should be like that, except that you don't have the same play out in this world. You don't have physical children. You have the children of the kingdom are your children. God's children are your children. The human beings that are still spiritual children are your children. So you share God's family with him. And he's very concerned about his children and his family. So that means your conversation with God, in, in addition to of learning the word, because you have to know the word. the word. The word is Christ in you. If you don't build up Christ in you with the word, he'll start to deteriorate. You have to study the word. I looked in the Zohar this morning because I didn't know what I would be talking about today. I looked in the Bible, I looked in the Zohar. I didn't have anything. So the page that I opened to in the Zohar this morning was a part of the, of the Zohar that I had not read before. And it was interesting because it was saying how studying the Bible is more powerful than prayer. Studying the Bible is more powerful than being on your knees and whatever whatever the children do, however they pray, whatever you've been taught, you know, even if you pray in tongues, the, the, the primary, the most, the most successful way of praying is by studying the Word. Not just reading it, but studying it because the Word is God. He is the Word. And He wants to communicate with you. So when you put your mind to the Word to, with an intention of understanding it and praying about it, or listening to a message that explains it to you, not from some carnal teacher, but as long as it's the, it doesn't have to be me, but it has to be a teacher that's actually teaching you the Word. There, there used to be good teachers that taught the letter of the Word. Hard to find today. That it's, it's higher than prayer because you could be praying the wrong things. This is direct communication with God. So, I stopped to tell you that and I lost my place. So anyway, that was what happened. And I said to the Lord on the way here this morning, I said, Lord, I really need protection against pride because I'm not willing to lose what you've given me. I'm not willing to lose this place because of pride, so you just really need to help me. Is it true? Is it, is it true that Christ in me implementing the word that you taught me saved your life? And that that was the prayer that saved her life. And the only other person that could have saved her life was someone that could have gotten close enough to you to ask you what you would do and that you would have answered them. I said, is that true? That she would have died if I didn't pray that prayer? And he said, yes. It's very overwhelming. So marriage to God means that you are his representative in the earth. That 
he's inside of you. He's a husband that's inside of you continuously. Meeting your every need, protecting you. But you are doing his work in the earth because he is invisible. And the way he set it up, it's his, well, this is the full creation, but the way it's set up is that he, he, he moves through people. Could he have not saved her without me? I'm sure he could have because all things are possible with God. But he stays within his own guidelines. And he does his work through people. And the closer you are to him, the more likely it is that miracles will come from you. And the thought that came to me, or one of the thoughts that came to me, a lot of thoughts come to me, is that comparing the Pentecostal type prayer and this type prayer, you know, where that I, I have never met anybody that raised the dead. Have you met anybody that raised the dead? Well, I think, I think Jesse said he raised the dead once. Yeah. I think, I don't know anyone else that raised the dead or claims to have raised the dead. We don't see miracles like that. I never saw, even in the height of the Pentecostal revival around here on Long Island, I never saw anything like that. I never saw the dead raised. And uh, uh, Bill Norton, the prophet that visits once a year, he visits a local church once a year, and I've been going to see him for the past five years or so. Those of us in New York have gone to see him for the past five years or so. He goes into the Middle East a lot. And uh, I think he goes into the Far East too, but he goes into the Middle East. And he tells us, that because in particular, he was speaking to one local pastor who seemed to be very enamored, uh, very uh, impressed with uh, Christians with PhDs. So that's what's happening to the church today. I mean, in the church that I was raised in, Nobody's impressed with a PhD that you get from a Bible college, yeah. from any other college. The only thing that impresses me, I, really, it's really hard to impress me, brother. It's very hard to impress me. I'm not impressed with your money. You know? I'm not impressed with your car, because I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> so if you drive up in a, a Lexus or a Cadillac, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and a Honda, and that's the truth. <laughs> I might say that's a nice car. Susan Smith, that's true, isn't that true about me? Yeah. Susan said, yeah, I don't even know that car. So, the only thing that impresses me is the anointing on you. That's the only thing that impresses me. If you have the anointing, I want to be with you. And if you don't have the anointing, I'll help you if I can, but I don't want to get too close to you. That's the only thing that impresses me. So I lost my place in Roma. What was I talking about? I was saying, yeah, mar marriage to God, marriage to God. So when you're married to God, your, your family is is the children of the kingdom. So, oh, I know what I was telling you. Yes, about prayer. So Bill Norton, he, he, um, he, he, I knew he was talking to this one young preacher that. He thought he was going to, he announced publicly that he was going to bring revival to Long Island. He was going to bring revival to Long Island. And he was in, he had, he had rallies or revivals with everyone, well, every one of the speakers was a PhD from a Bible college. And needless to say, he fell flat on his face. You know. He not only has not brought revival to Long Island, but he doesn't have any more, any more revivals. <laughs> He fell flat on his face. So this this Bill Norton, I believe, was speaking to him. He was saying, you know, you don't need a PhD. These people in the Middle East, a lot of them, he said, they don't read or write. But when someone dies, they don't bury them right away. They bring them to the church. They lay them out in the church, and they pray until God tells them, either, until either God raises them from the dead, or God tells them that they're dead and they bury them. That, that was Bill Norton's testimony, prophet and evangelist to the Middle East. The man has a deep walk with God. 
and with what came to me yesterday, well, we don't see anyone raising the dead. And that Pentecostal type, pri pri Pentecostal type prayer doesn't raise the dead. But what happened yesterday, it didn't raise the dead, but it saved your life. That that's one step before the anointing to raise the dead. What I'm trying to say is that to raise the dead, you have to be really close to God. But for that power to flow through you to raise the dead, first of all, it has to be his will. You can't do it because of your own desire. And I know over the years, I mentioned a couple of times that Peter in the book of Acts, before he raised Dorcas from the dead, he asked permission. An apostle with miracle working power asked permission to raise Dorcas from the dead. And I also remind you that before he raised her from the dead, it was stated in the scripture that the brethren that knew her testified to her, her good works in the body of Christ, that the, the, the sacrificial life that she led to in a manner that would please God. So she wasn't just raised from the dead because her father missed her or her mother loved her. Or there was a, there was a, with a, Moses reasoned with God. You know, we, we can reason with God. We can tell him, look Lord, I, I think there's a good reason to raise this person from the dead or to not let them die. Will, will you, will you let them live? And this is why, this is why I think that they should live. I've been praying like that for years. Sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. There was a woman that was dying from cancer, but I think she had four or six kids a year or two ago. I didn't know her personally. Someone told me about her. And I asked to go, God to have mercy. I don't know what she was supposedly born again, but I didn't know her. But that's a good enough reason she wants to live to raise her kids. But I didn't know what was going on in the family. There are all kinds of all kinds of circumstances that have to be weighed one against the other, and we cannot do that if we don't know all the facts. God is the only one that knows all the facts. So if I know the person personally, I'll state the facts and I'll have an opinion. So I didn't have any opinion with this woman because I didn't know her, but I I was I was requested to pray for her and I did, and she died. With her, left her six children, motherless, four or six children. But I do pray that way. There have been people in this ministry that have had serious illnesses, and I have prayed that way. I have said, Look, Lord, there are benefits to your kingdom. You know, this is what I'm telling you right now. This would really be rejected by the church at large. It tells you that God just loves everybody. Well, if he loves everybody, why, why do so many people die and suffer? But the church, they don't even listen to what they teach. It's the, the, the responsibility is the fivefold ministry. They don't even listen to what they're saying. So, they don't even analyze what they're saying. It doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, God loves you, but if you reject Jesus, then he'll let you die. But what about my neighbor who didn't reject Jesus and he died? And what about the man from the church I asked you to pray for that's paralyzed on one side, that he and his whole family and five kids have served God for years in that church, and he's still paralyzed? Doesn't God love you? you know? There has to be more to it than that, brethren. There has to be more to it than that. And I said this to someone the other night. I wonder if I had the opportunity to talk to that man, if you would call him, it was a year ago that I told you that. That he and his whole family had served that church for many years and then he just got, went to work one morning and had a stroke and he was paralyzed. Well, so he was completely paralyzed and he couldn't do anything for himself, couldn't even sit up in a chair by himself. I wonder what his reaction would be if, if the Lord made an opportunity for me or someone like me to go to that man and his wife and the children were teenagers old enough to, to be a part of this. 
say to them, look, this is the whole truth. This is a judgment. It couldn't have happened to you without legal ground. Would you be willing for the Lord to reveal to you what the legal ground was? If you, if you heard it, would, would you confess it as sin? And see if that wouldn't bring forth the healing, if, you, if that wouldn't be enough for him to bring forth the healing in this dimension. I, I, don't, I don't know. That would have to be desperate enough to try it. would have to be desperate enough to try anything. But it's really hard to believe because you've been taught so differently at the church. But that's what marriage to God is, brethren. It makes you, it puts you in the ministry. It puts you right in the center of what he's doing with humanity. You are his spokesperson. You see? And I've known for a long time that I've been a priest years ago. Years ago, years and years and years ago, he gave a dream to someone who was not here anymore, she died. That there was a priest in a dream, and whatever the rest of the dream was, I said to her, you know, that's me. The Lord told me that I'm a priest, and she couldn't believe it. It was her dream, and she didn't believe it. Well, the Lord told me something else unbelievable today, and I have to believe it, that Jesus is our high priest. But the high priest in Israel entered into the most holy place. And I'm in the most holy place. That means not only am I a priest, but I'm the high priest of, in, in human flesh. Jesus is the high priest. I am the, to people, you don't say to people, oh, Jesus is the high priest and I'm his flesh. I am the high priest in the earth today. What does that mean? that this relationship that he has with me, that makes me an apostle and a priest, has ascended to that level. It, it shouldn't surprise us. We're, we're hoping and praying for the fourth greater soul to come down. So shouldn't this be part of it? It's an ascension in office. It's not just the fourth greater soul coming down. When, you, when it, and, and that's a process. And for all I know, it's probably in the process right now but the process has to be completed, I would think, before it affects my body. And my body hasn't been affected yet. So I know that it's not, not complete. I cannot say I have the fourth grade of soul. I cannot say that. But it's been prophesied that I will have miracle working power. So what I'm trying to tell you is that what happened yesterday, maybe you could consider it a miracle. Maybe, that's, maybe that was a miracle. Maybe that's the beginning of miracles. But what I'm trying to say right now is that it's the, the next step is the, is the ability to raise the dead. That might, that might be considered a miracle what happened yesterday. It's up to the Lord to say, yeah, your name. That might very well be considered a miracle. If it was, if it is to be considered a miracle, then the miracle working power which is the second of the three signs of apostleship, has now appeared in this ministry. So it's a very profound time. It's a very profound thing, the thing that's happening. And I had the thought this morning that, um, that Something like that had to happen in this ministry. Now, God, God doesn't make you sick, okay? We all have open doors. And if you can hear this without getting upset over it, because God is righteous, and the more you understand the truth, the more likely it is that you will move into the most holy place. If that's what you want, he's not going to force you. So let's say... Let's say, according to, to the Lord's guidelines, okay, what's happening in the world has to be reflected in his ministry that's in the most holy place. I, I told you at the beginning of this exhortation that many areas of my life line up with scriptural archetypes. So let's say that's the truth. That the suffering of the world has to be reflected in the ministry 
because when the overcoming takes place in the ministry, then the overcoming can take place in the world. So, in the world and in this country. This country is the hub, okay, where the, the father, um, you know, I don't want to say anything that's controversial, but when, uh, the Democratic Republic, the Representative Republic was born here. The what has affected the world for good through this ministry. This is through this country. That's where his base is, and therefore America is very important in, in my opinion. So I talk a lot about what's happening here because also it's it's what I know about. We're in crisis right now, and nobody knows whether we're going to live or die. The country is in death throes right now. The, the country as it was founded is in death throes. No one knows that we're going to be. And socialism, brethren, socialism is just one step before communism. You know, it, it, is the, is it, will, will it be the death of the representative republic and will become a tyrannical state? run by multinational billionaires that hate us? Or will the republic survive? So we had a miracle yesterday, and I guess the Lord's saying it was a miracle. So we had a miracle in the ministry yesterday, and that's a sign that the, rep the representative republic will survive. It happened here, and it will happen there. And if America survives, then the rest of the world will survive in a state of freedom. Wherever it's possible, can. Eventually, the whole world will be free. But, so, you know, sometimes there are benevolent, benevolent uh, dictatorships. Some, some, rather than to have a representative republic, you have to have an educated populace. So wherever, wherever there is a, a republic, a democratic state, but you have to be careful to not say democracy. And every time I hear it on the news, I rebuke them. Because a, a democracy is not, is not a good form of government. Because the people can be seduced. So if you get 51% of the people that say child molestation is good, and man-boy sex is good, and putting children in cages is OK to get the adrenochrome from them, then that's what your country is. So democracy is not good because the people are, are the people of bread, the scripture says. The people of bread, they can be eaten up. So we're, we're a nation of laws. So you have to have a law that no matter what happens to your mind, the law stands. It's the same thing as saying God swore, you see. So anyway, being married to God, what was I talking about? Being married to God puts you in that place of intimacy with him that brings miracle working power. And to love it is a tremendous responsibility. You just Jesus did not just go around healing people and raising them from the dead. The scripture clearly said that uh, he saw that they had the faith to be healed and have something. The, I mean, the Lord can do anything that he wants. He can have, he can have mercy on a stranger walking down the street, but my understanding of the scripture is that he heals the people that know him, or that are at least crying out to him. So it's the, it's the job of the priest to teach. So what, what, is, what is primary, one of the primary, as I understand it, um, um, priorities of, of God with regard to humanity at this time is to get teaching priests out to the public. He wants the people to know the truth about him, about how, what, what a God human being love is. It doesn't mean that you get everything that you want. God love means intimacy with God, which means he lives his life through you, which means your life 
if it interferes with his life, it goes down the drain and there's no argument about it. God's love is a very mature love. It requires a mature person. God, you know, God tells us, if, if God is a servant that's going to die, he tells them. There was someone in this ministry that he told they were going to die. I don't know whether he told it to them before they went into the hospital or after they went into the hospital. But they lived another few months and they died. And it's in the scripture. I think I just heard it this morning from my wedding of Bible. The, the people that have an intimacy with God, he tells you. He tells you if you're going to die. When I told Hezekiah he was going to die. And Hezekiah asked for a reprieve and he got 15 more years. God will tell you secrets like that. So I would like to review to for you, because it's, the teaching is relatively new, it's re really important that we understand this and that we can convey this to other people. Why people that have faith in, in Jesus Christ die sometimes, or get seriously ill. So, so let me go over the doctrine of redemption for you again, because it's really important that you understand this. The, the power of God, the degree of the power of God that's um, flowing into the world at this time is limited. It's veiled. It's, it's filtered. It's filtered. Well, why would that be? Well, well, the teaching has been from the beginning that God is in a very high spiritual place and that if he interacts with flesh or with the soul realm, the soul realm is the exact opposite of the of the spirit of God. Excuse me. If they interact, that the spirit of God would cause the destruction of that which is soul. The soul is not righteous. So from the very beginning, and all of the teachings that we've had from the beginning of torture and Kabbalah teaches that God is literally stepping down into this world, or stepping into this world, it's not really down, it's really across. So he's stepping from the most ethereal, the most sheer, for lack of a better word, a dimension of spirituality that is beyond our comprehension. And he's getting closer and closer and closer to the soul world, okay? And at the same time, preparing the soul world to receive him. So he has to filter his light or it would destroy us. The first time I read that, I was offended. <laughs> that God is holding back from us. You know, uh, but he is, because without understanding, it would destroy us. And, and his power without this understanding, we would be great, and we would be killing people. Uh, to have his power without his wisdom, without his character, would be a disaster. So for 2,000 years now, and who knows how long before that, before he brought, before he saved the first man and, and made him the name of God, uh, uh, it's taking all this time for the Lord to develop a human being that will survive the process of the, tr of the transition of the first Adam into the second Adam. So it's the inner man that forms the body. The body is just a slave. The one who you see talking to you, the one who I'm talking to, the ones who I'm talking to. It's your personality that I'm talking to. It's your personal, it's your personal soul that, that I'm talking to. Your body is just a beast. So that's who the beast is. The, the human being in whom the, the beast consciousness is ruling over the spiritual consciousness of the breath of Jehovah that's in the person that's been corrupted. That's who the beast is. The beast of Revelation, that's who the beast is. 
So we have one creation with different parts. And the question is, which part is ruling over which part? If the beast part is ruling over the spiritual part, the, the beast dies. Okay. The spiritual part doesn't die, doesn't die, okay? The spiritual part doesn't die, it just reincarnates. The beast, the body, okay? The beast dies. If the wrong spiritual part is ruling through the beast, the beast dies, sometimes gets sick and dies. So the whole future of the beast has to do with the soul that's living through it. Um, is, is the spiritual part of the soul ruling over the bestial part of the soul? That's the whole question, you see. And, um, sorry about that. The, um, we're born, we're born, we're not born with the spirit of God. We're not born with the personality of God. We're born with the, all of us, we're, we're born, every part of us, as a production, so to speak, of the breath of Jehovah, who's become a harlot and run away with the snake and produced an illegitimate child. This whole world, including the people in it, and the animals and everything in it, the humanity and the environment that we live in, are the, the spiritual child that was birthed by the first Adam. The first Adam gave birth. Adam is really spiritually female. We speak of him as a male because he's male to us, but he's God's wife. Adam is God's wife, and, and he's female. And he's, I, I remember I had that question, I had that question years ago when I was really just starting out, and they had just, the scientists had just discovered Lucy. <laughs> they just discovered Lucy, who they claimed to be uh, a pre-human, pre-homo pre sapien creature that was the beginning of all of you, of everything that eventually became humanity. And that first creature was a female. And I asked a pastor at the time, how, how could that be? You know, and of course he didn't have the answer. But the answer is that Adam is a female. And he was told to go forth and produce and fill the earth. What does that mean, fill the earth? What is the earth? We are the earth. We are earthen vessels. You see, the earth that's formed into vessels. And Adam, okay, the Son of God, is destined to fill us. And then God dwells in Adam, and the two of them dwell in us. So the first Adam, he gave birth. He only had one seed. See, it was only one seed. And he gave birth, and this world is what was born. And it was a corrupt world, so we die. The vessels die. The bestial world dies. The spiritual part of it doesn't die. It just keeps trying over and over again. And fails every time. So God had to give a second seed. The second seed is the second Adam, who is the Lord from heaven. He's not formed from the earth. The first man was formed from the earth. Remember, Jehovah formed the man from the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life into him. He produced a corrupt creation. So God sent another seed. And he's not going to repeat the process. He's not forming another man and starting all over again. But he gave another seed, which is the Lord from heaven, the spiritual man. Righteous Adam, Adam who was joined to Elohim, and he injected, he injected that second seed into the first seed, into the earth of the first seed, and it's been growing there for thousands of years ever since it entered into Sarah's womb, and from Sarah's womb entered into the fetus that was born as Isaac. the second man. So, and of course he, he, he was fully born as uh, that, seed was, that seed was born as a human being 
not fully born, but born as a human being in Jesus of Nazareth. In Jesus of Nazareth, his soul was saved, but his body died. And his soul was was joined to righteous Adam that saved him. And now he's at the right hand of the Father, but he doesn't have a body. He doesn't have a body. So we are his bodies. He's trying to get us to marry him. So the sons of God of Genesis 6 were not evil. They were doing what Jesus is doing now. These many soul parts are trying to marry the daughters of men. We are the daughters of the daughters of men, meaning the daughters of Adam. So these bodies die. So the power of God that flows into this world is limited, or it would destroy us like it destroyed Uzzah, who touched the ark when he had been warned not to do that. The power of God that's available through the glorified Jesus Christ is the power to convert our souls. It's the power to convert our personal soul, which is our personality. Our personal soul is Cain. He is being adopted. The rescue of the creation is taking place inside of human beings. God is not breaking the vessels. What breaks the what does that mean breaking the vessels? It means people die. People die, thousands of people, if not millions of people across the earth die every day. Babies are born and people die. This is the fallen corrupt creation. So God has put his new seed right into the fallen creation and is converting us a man at a time from the inside. And he can't do it without the people understanding what's happening and agreeing with him and joining with him. So education is the absolute name of the game. So people have questions and they want to know why God lets babies die and people die and good so-called good people die. I'm trying to get it out of my mouth. It hasn't come out yet. So the personal soul, the personality, is being converted. The personal soul molds the body. The body dies when the personal soul can't keep it alive anymore. It runs out of energy. Why? Because the mind, the mind that's in the vessel feeds off of the energy of the personal soul. And then the personal soul cannot sustain the body anymore. And the body dies and the personal soul dies. So the personal soul is called Cain. And he's being, he's, she's being cons converted into Abel, who is Jehovah's priest. See, the book of Revelation says you're all kings and priests. Everyone that Christ is inside of is a priest. And I believe there will be many manifestations of his high priest. Whoever gets into the most holy place becomes an expression of his high priesthood. Will be a many member of high priest. In Israel, there was one high priest and many priests. I believe, unless I'm mistaken, there will be many, I don't know, a lot, but there will certainly be, I believe, more than one person that will make it into the most holy place and be an expression of the high priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, you can, if, if Christ is in you and he's living through you, then you're a priest. So, Cain is being converted to Abel, who is God's priest, he's Jehovah's priest. Cain serves Satan and Leviathan, the Carmine, the powers and principalities that rule over this world. And Abel serves the Lord Jesus Christ. He's one of the priests in the new order of priesthood that we're calling the Melchizedekian priesthood, or the priest from the tribe of Judah. But once, and we, we explained all that, that initially the first physically Jewish person okay, where the um, Christianity and Judaism, the, the, everything that's of God that's in Christianity and everything that's of God in Judaism is blended together in Christ Jesus. It, at first, the first time it had to happen would be in a physically Jewish person. After that, okay, every human being that has the experience that Christ is in them, Christ develops in them, 
and you too are a priest of the tribe of Judah. That's my understanding right now. Because if it's happening to you and it's living through you, it doesn't matter what your physical body is. But for the first time, it had to happen in a physical due to fulfill the scripture. So you're all priests of the tribe of Judah with different degrees of power, different, of different ages, depending where you are. I don't know where you are. I don't have any track record of you, especially if you're not in New York. I, I, God, I, God doesn't talk to me about that. But I trust that you're all doing well because you're holding on. I'm sure you're all having good trials and tribulations that are trying to knock you out, and you're all standing firm, so I trust you're all doing well. I only hear if you're in trouble. <laughs> I only hear about you if you're in trouble. And I haven't heard from any of you being in trouble in a while now. The last person that was in trouble, I think they're doing okay now. The last I heard, they were doing okay, that the Lord has restored them. I hope that that's true. I haven't heard from them for a while. So, as your soul is, and how is your soul converted? Well, this is your consciousness, your personality. You have to hear this message. You have to hear the message. You have to understand that you're a sinner. And that sin is not just in your hand, it's not just your behavior, but sin is in the unconscious part of your mind where Satan and Leviathan are. Mm -hmm. That we die, our body and our personal soul dies because the mind that literally is keeping us going, because where would we be without a mind, mm -hmm. is illegal, it's, it's adulterous. And our personality submits to that unholy mind from the day that it's born. But from the day that Christ enters into the unconscious part of your mind, it then becomes a warfare in the unconscious part of your mind over which power Christ or Satan and Leviathan, which power will be the source of your motives and the thoughts that arise from your motives. And that's why we have to bring every imagination into captivity to discover whether they come from Satan or Leviathan or Christ. And everything that comes from Satan or Leviathan, even if it sounds good, if you want if you want the promises, it must be discarded to the point that only Christ becomes our motives. So this is a process. It takes a lifetime. Sometimes a lifetime is not enough. And the person dies. But the goal is the conversion of your personality that is converting Cain in you to Abel. What does that mean then? Your personality less and less is submitting to the dictates of Satan and Leviathan. Satan, Satan is basically envy and, uh, and Leviathan is all pride. Satan is envy, mostly envy, it's just general words, envy and witchcraft. Leviathan, they're typified by Jezebel and, uh, and Ahab. So Ahab is greedy, he's filled, filled with pride, he wants Naboth's vineyard, and he can't get it, so he's, 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 um, he's just feeling sorry for himself. And Jezebel comes in and uses witchcraft to get it for him. So those two principles are in our mind. Our pride wants something, God doesn't give it to us. So Satan, it's an unconscious, it's an unconscious move of our mind goes forth and does whatever needs to be done to give it to our pride, which is you know, in the subconscious part of our mind. So what that means, it means that we're, we're aware that we want it. It's subconscious. We're aware that we want it. It's subconscious and conscious. We're aware that we want it. We may not be aware of how badly we want it. And then the unconscious part of our mind that's willing to do evil to get it, that's unconscious. We don't admit to that. So Cain, is subject to them. Cain is subject to the motives of Satan and Anna. But with this education, Cain has the a possibility of obeying only Christ. And as he starts obeying Christ, his soul starts to be converted. And the more he rejects the motives, of, the more he's able to recognize and then reject the motives of, of uh, Satan and Leviathan, his soul, because we only have one personality. We have, it's a two-sided personality. We can manifest Christ, which is able, which is regenerated able, 
uh, regenerated in a different form, Abel, because now Jesus is a, is a part of it. Oh, um, we, we may be manifesting Christ or submitting to Christ in one area and still submitting to Satan and Leviathan, yielding to those urges that pride gives us in, a, in another area. So it's a, the conversion process is a conversion. It requires recognition of the sin, which is called confession. It, it requires an understanding that sin is in the unconscious part of the mind, and that Christ, who's in the unconscious part of the mind, can tell us what's going on in the unconscious part of our mind. See? And then we have the opportunity to confess it as sin and resist it, flee to Christ for strength and resist it. So we're going back and forth during our lifetime. The more we confess our sins and understand that it's possible to have a, a sin that doesn't make any sense. I remember when this ministry first started and I had this message. We had some people here who aren't here now. They've passed on. The ministry is 32 years old, and then we have people who served here faithfully who died from old age. You know? um, and I, I pointed out that there was some envy. And they very sincerely said to me, why in the world would I be envious about that? I, I have the same thing. Well, you know, brethren, some people are envious when you get what they already have. Did you know that? That people could be jealous. They, are, they have it, they can have even more than you. And they're jealous when you get it. It's not rational. Sin is not rational, you see. So the person that can understand this, and to do this, we really have to step back and look at ourselves and say, I am Christ and this other activity is in my mind and I never even knew that it was there. And I don't want it, I reject it, I'm not a part of it, I won't have anything to do with it. If you don't do that, then you wind up justifying yourself. When sin is revealed in you, then you deny it because you, you believe that you are, you are the sinner. So that's really difficult because I'll, I'm telling you, well, you have to confess the sin and you're guilty of the sin. Why are you, how, Sheila, you just confused me. You just told me you have to step back and realize that you're not the sinner and rebuke the sin. And then you have to confess that you're the sinner. Well, brother, there are different parts of us. Okay? So that motive, that, that's, that part of us, that's Satan in the unconscious part of us. She's the sinner and she's a part of us. Okay. But there's another part of us called the personal soul that's looking at her and saying, I don't agree with you. We're a divided house, you see. And a divided house cannot stand. This house will fall. But when it falls, there's going to be another, Lord willing, another house. And that's the house of Christ Jesus. The house has to fall. The soul has to be overthrown, you see. And I'm really thankful to God because I can never answer that question until today. Yeah. Yes, it's a contradiction. But no, it's not a contradiction if you understand that there are two parts of you. And that the part of you that loves God and that wants to be a righteous person. You see, you can't just want to live forever. You need to, you need to love his character. You need to want his righteousness. You see. And then you start rejecting what's another part of you. Once you can do that, then it's easy. But as long as you think that, you know, as long as you don't recognize that there's another part of you that's attached to God, and that is you have, you have full potential to be everything you've ever hoped to be, the righteous person that you've ever hoped to be, that you could cleave to him and say, I don't want that other part of me. If you can't do that, then when I reveal sin, you condemn. Because you don't, you think the whole, the whole of it is you, and then, then it's hopeless, then you just defend yourself. So then you just defend yourself and say, it's not true, I didn't do that. I'm not capable of that. I'm not like that. I don't do things like that. I would have never done anything like that. But you did. But you didn't see it happening because it was Satan in the unconscious part of your mind. And you were not yet trained, even though Christ made it in you, you were not yet trained to make that division. I did it but I'm not that person anymore. I'm still responsible for it. It's like, it's like a person that has multiple personalities. Whichever personality is, uh, is speaking through the, through the body at that time, the body 
is responsible. If you have a multiple personality and you murder somebody and then that personality goes away and another personality comes in, that body still goes to jail and gets executed if there's a death penalty. You see? So it's, it's, it's essential that you understand this or you will not be confessing the sins of the side of you that is satan, it's just a part of you. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said it's better to enter into life with one hand than to enter, than to go into hell. He didn't mean the, the church type hell, which I don't believe exists. This world is hell, you know. It's, and I, I translated those scriptures recently. It's better because this world, we could be in heaven or hell in this world. It's better to be, to have intimacy with Jesus Christ. His love, his love is the anointing. His love is the anointing that empowers you, that makes you feel good. It's better to be with Jesus, okay, with only one hand. What is the one hand? The one hand is the regenerated Abel or Christ in you. And the other hand is Cain. It's better to be in a heavenly place through union and intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you only, yeah, what does that mean? It means that you have no power, that you don't have the power of the natural man in this world. It means that you're giving up the power that the Satan gives you. What does that mean? Well, you're having a, a fight with somebody and you revert to your, to your Cain personality and you, you say things about them that aren't true or you say things that, you know, are gonna hurt them. Or you bring up things that have nothing to do with this argument. It's called a spiritual defeat. You just weaken them in any way you can. Well, you always were an ugly person, okay? I didn't want you anyway. Let's say it's a man and a woman breaking up. You're not pretty enough for me, you know? Or, or you're not enough of a man, or you know, we're not, you're not fighting over the issues where there could possibly be a resolution, but you attack the person personally. It's a spiritual defeat. You wound them, and I guess maybe it's true that they're not a pretty person or, or a woman, or maybe it's true that the man isn't the most manly person in the world. So you wound, they know it's true, so you wound them and then they lose their ability to fight uh, a godly fight, which is, pr producing, uh, which is dealing with the issues that maybe you're really doing something wrong that you're trying to cover up by attacking them like that. That's what Cain does. So, so if you can recognize that and separate from it, you enter into heaven, into intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ, through Christ, because you have cut off that part of you that used to fight like that. Does that make any sense to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's your one hand, you say. The, the, the church is just filled with false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is desperate to get his truth out there. Of course, um, Jesus is never desperate. I mean, he's, he's highly motivated. That's, that's human hyperbole. You know, that he's desperate to get the word out there. He wants the truth to be known. Because he wants intimacy with all of you. What's intimacy with Israel? Actually, I would like to share with you that. The word cleared that up with me also. Although maybe I didn't make my point yet. The, would you please uh, remind me, okay, what the word cleared up about? Um, about is everybody going to have Christ? All you, or is all humanity going to have Christ? So, with regard to the, the redemption of the body, okay, the body is a reflection of your personal soul. So the healthier your personal soul is, the healthier your body is. But the power of God that is needed to, to stop you from getting sick. Because right, right now what the Lord does is that he heals you. If you get sick, then he heals you. He either heals you or he doesn't heal you. But the power of God to stop you from getting sick, to stop it before it happens, isn't really here right now. The, the power of God, the measure of, of the power of God that's here is, is, has the power to convert your soul. But that power does not extend to the, it's from, from the innermost point, working its way out, okay? It does not extend to the body. It doesn't extend to the body. So the body gets sick. It gets sick because of the areas of the soul that cannot preserve it. And then, if the Lord does it, if all, all factors are, are positive, you know, then the Lord might heal your body. Okay, the power of God to stop you from getting sick before it happens 
is not here right now. That power is in the fourth grade of soul. So the body has to be ransomed. That word redemption actually means ransom. And it really means the original use of the word ransom was that there was a man of the flesh that Jehovah breathed the breath of life. I'm sorry, there was a man, and there was a, a dust man, a man from dust, made of the dust, and he was dead. And Jehovah ransomed that man by breathing the breath of life into him. So the body needs to be ransomed. We need, um, we need enough of the Spirit of God to preserve the body. And the Holy Spirit will not, the Holy Spirit of promise does not do that. Okay? And even the Holy Spirit of truth that we have, the Holy Spirit of truth that I have, is not doing that. We need the, the fourth grade of soul, okay? The measure of the spirit of truth that I have does not preserve my body. As you all know, I still get sick, okay? unfortunately. But the fourth grade of soul will link up, will join with the measure of the spirit of truth that I have, and my body will be healed of everything, and your body will be healed of everything when you have that experience. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. We don't receive the fourth grade of soul in a vacuum. Okay, we, it's everything that I just explained to you. Okay, the recognizing that we're a, a when, well, I mean, I've been preaching for years that James says we're a double-minded person, but I never understood it to the degree that I just explained it to you. We're not just double-minded. We're literally two people inside of this body. We're literally, if Christ is in you, you're literally two people two personalities sharing this body. And the two personalities are struggling with each other, just like the two children in the womb of, uh, of Rebecca. And the two children in the womb of Tamar, Judah's daughter-in-law. That's our experience. They're struggling with each other. If you're fighting, if there's no fight, then, then either you don't have Christ or there's no struggle going on and you're dead. So we're literally two people inside of this body. And depending on the measure of us, well, there's nothing, there's nothing with this level of power that's in the earth right now. What do we have? We have the third grade of soul. That's the measure of power that's in the earth right now. We have the, great, the third grade of soul, which is righteous Adam, okay? which, is, which is Christ. But we need the fourth grade of soul, which is the supernal mother, the third degree of power of the world of emanation joining to Christ in us, and that brings the mother and the son, because we have the third grade of soul, Christ is the son, and, this, and, the, and the, the breath of Jehovah is in him, okay. So we need the mother and the son, the, fourth, the third, fourth grade of soul, and then Christ within us, when he's linked with his mother, will be powerful enough to protect the body, not only heal it after it gets sick, but protect the body. So that's the truth about the body, and redemption actually means ransom, and ransom does not necessarily mean that the body is being held by a criminal. It simply means that the body is lacking what it needs to live forever. The body needs to be ransomed because it's lacking what it needs to, to overcome death. The body needs to be ransomed because it's lacking what it needs to overcome death. Redemption, the real definition of the word is ransom. The reason the body, the material body needs to be ransomed is because it's lacking what it needs to overcome death. Christ in us, the third grade of power, or the third grade of soul, third grade of soul, is not powerful enough to keep this body alive. And it has to do with sin. So the bringing down of the fourth grade of soul, the fourth grade of soul, which is the mother, which will join with Christ in us, which is the Son, okay? And the mother and son combination will be powerful enough to ransom the material body. To, there will be enough power of God to keep the material body alive, to heal it if it's sick, and, and keep it from dying. And there will be the power to overcome death of the body. See? But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to be, you have to be in a war in the unconscious part of your mind. You have to understand this message that Christ is, it's all in the unconscious part of your mind, which is, a, it's not in your head, it's in a spiritual dimension. 
and the war is going on between Christ and you, and the Lord Jesus is assisting him, and and Satan and Leviathan and you. The war was between the first Adam and the second Adam. The war is between the elements or the parts of the first Adam and the second Adam, and they're fighting over your personal soul, your personality, and your body. So when you're the side that your personal soul throws its weight into, that's the, that's the side that's going to win. And you will, you will receive the fourth grade of soul if you just don't die before the process is complete. Well, Shiloh, what kind of a thing is that to say, well, you have to pray about it, brethren. I just told you the truth. And uh, I do, do have a question from the Lord for something that I asked, possibly even in front of you. I told you I didn't know whether what I'm preaching, does it go to the, to the whole world or just to Israel? I was confused, and I'm not confused anymore. Um, it goes to Israel, okay? Everything that I'm preaching is with spiritual Israel, okay? Your Israel of Christ is in you. If Christ is in you and living through you, you're Israel. This message is for Israel. When Israel comes into existence, because Israel is barely, Israel is not even born yet. Spiritual Israel is not even born yet. We're, this spiritual Israel is here in this ministry and we're in utero. We've not been revealed to the world or even to the body of Christ yet. So we're still in utero. We've not been revealed to Israel yet. And when we are revealed to Israel, there will be many more that are part of spiritual Israel. When spiritual Israel comes into existence, the true Israel, what's going on over in the Middle East is a, is a travesty, is a travesty that any, any fivefold ministry pre preacher would tell you that that is a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, if it was up to me, I'd just take you right down out of the pulpit. God is long-suffering. I don't have that kind of power, and I, I wouldn't even pray it because I know that it's arrogance. <laughs> But I, would, I, I just declare the whole, everyone preaching that guilty, I declare you guilty. That you're lying to the church, you're deceiving the church, you're bringing false doctrine into the spiritual dimensions, you're a disgrace. You're a disgrace, all of you out there that are preaching that. The true Israel is spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel doesn't have a geographical land other than the, the physical body of its members. So we are a nation, brethren. You can't see it yet, but we, we will be born, and we will, the citizens of Israel will recognize each other by the Spirit. The citizens of Israel will recognize each other by the Spirit. A new nation is being born of, one, of a new blood, of the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll recognize each other instantly. And when Israel comes into into its fullness, Israel, all of the parts of Israel, which are all of the people that Christ is living through, okay, become the priest or the mediator between the Lord Jesus Christ, between, uh, between Jehovah and the nations. Israel is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The nation and made up of all its members become the mediator between Jehovah God and the nations. So the nations will not have what we have. They will not have Christ in them, okay? But, but by being attached to us, by being attached to the priesthood, Israel is the priesthood, okay? By being attached to the priesthood, they will have everything that they need from God. It will flow from Jehovah through us to the nations. We're mediating a mediating nation, a priestly nation, a kingdom of priests that attach the rest of the world to God so that they too can, I don't, still don't know whether they would live forever, but whether they would receive immortality of the flesh, I don't know about that yet. At least I got part of the answer to you. So, um, that's all I have to say right now, so I think I'll take a break and we'll see if the Lord will give us anything else. Are there any questions? Anyone have anything to say? Yes? Yes, absolutely. Um, you just said 
that we would be the mediating is Israel, I guess spiritual Israel, be the, the mediators to the rest of the world. So, but you don't, you, you don't have to be Jewish from Jewish heritage. Like, a, so, so the people in your ministry in LDS will be your body has nothing to do with it. Okay, so now the people that you're ministering to, so so for the next the next stage of priests, do they have the potential to advance and become one of us? That's a good question. I really don't know the answer to that. I I don't know the answer. I, I think that I was asking that question myself. And if that's true, then eventually all of the nations would be swallowed up into Israel. Hmm. So I know, so from that, based on my on my understanding now, I think the answer is no, because then there would be no more nations. There would be just Israel. But yeah, this was the answer that came to me. At that point, what's coming, we're told in the book of Corinthians, that the day is coming that there will be no more, well, maybe that's the answer. That there will be no more mediator that that everyone will have a direct relationship with Jehovah, no more mediator. So the question is, does that happen in the flesh? Mm. We're not in the flesh. So if that happens in the flesh, that means all of the nations will be swallowed up into Jehovah and, and have a direct relationship with him. So then the answer would be yes under those conditions, yes. Mm, but I don't know for sure, but Yeah. No. And then um I mean nobody wrote in, but I just want to maybe be the second witness or, or confirm before you were saying about the miracle and you feel it's a miracle that, that came through you, that was the word in my heart when you were explaining everything, that you know the miracle powers were promised and the next stage and that's what was really on me that this, before I said it. Before you said it, that this wow. is the start of the wow. miracles. This is a miracle that wow. has happened. That is very exciting. Thank you for that witness. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> okay, I'll see you in about 15 minutes.